heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the race to regulate artificial intelligence. It's underway in Washington. This is OpenAI CEO Sam Altman lays out the benefits and the risks to senators. And the CEO of Andreessen backed Hippocratic AI joins us in studio to discuss their generative AI healthcare tech. And X, the parent company of Twitter, has made its first acquisition a tech talent recruiting service called Lasky. We discuss why. First, foremost, let's get to these markets because once again, we're actually seeing big tech on top. Lackluster trading day, muted as we worry about the debt ceiling. The arguments still abound between left and right. We're seeing Nasdaq 100 up five tenths of a cent. Big tech seen as some sort of haven at the moment. We'll talk about the individual names with Ed, but all country world index, as I show, the world is more down pat on markets at the moment. Bank of America really showing how much risk aversion there is coming from traders at the moment. And we're seeing down by three tenths of a percent, people not wanting to add to the stock market right now across the world. We're seeing 10-year yield actually up six basis points. Even as we see in the individual retail data coming out showing you and I still willing to spend in this inflationary data, it seems as though some of that Federal Reserve speak coming from Loretta Mester, from Barkin, seem to be hinting, look, that they're still all eyes on inflation. Let's have a look at what's happening in terms of Bitcoin as well, because the dollar is outperforming. That means Bitcoin's on the downside. We're off by about a percentage point in the day, still languishing around 27,000. But Ed, dig into some of the big movers, because there are points to the upside from big tech today. It's like a market that's treading water when you think about the macro. But when you think about the micro, there are some stories out there. Tesla up 1.6 percent, the AGM after the bell today. But Bloomberg reporting overnight, according to sources, Shanghai is moving towards trial production of an updated Model 3. That's supporting the stock. Baidu, speaking of China, also up 3.3 percent. Strong earnings, a beat on the top and bottom line. It's like a post-Chinese New Year rebound, a reopening of that economy, and it is boosting China tech. We get Alibaba later in the week, so we're going to continue to watch China tech, especially the U.S. listed shares of those names. AI. AI is everything. I just put a Twitter out there on video. All it said was AI is everything. And if you look at equity markets, we've discussed and we looked at all the column inches dedicated to how a lot of the momentum in the, in the start of 2023 originates from investor enthusiasm for AI. Amazon and Alphabet, parent of Google, both big movers to the upside, both big points gainers on the NASDAQ 100. We'll give you the details on why later in the show. But Bloomberg reporting that if you look at the signs, Amazon might be bringing a chat GPT style bot to Amazon.com, which is something we've been waiting for. But that's what the talk is about this Tuesday morning, artificial intelligence. It is, and how to regulate it. And right now, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, really telling lawmakers on Capitol Hill about perhaps steps necessary to put in place rules around AI. Technology, he says, is so powerful that he's worried it could have repercussions, quote, at a level far beyond anything we're prepared for. He also said, look, it's going to change the labor market. Take a listen. GPT-4 will, uh, I think, entirely automate away some jobs, and it will create new ones that we believe will be much better. Pleased to say we've just pulled out of that hearing Ed Anna Edgerton, who's been really listening in to not just Sam Altman, but we've also heard from representatives from IBM, who, well, we know that IBM's already saying they're cutting their back office staff, most likely because of AI, and scientists are represented too. What's the key takeaway thus far? It really has been all focused on regulation. You have Sam Altman of OpenAI and Christina Montgomery, the chief privacy and trust officer for IBM, almost pleading with lawmakers to regulate this space. They want guardrails and they want certainty to protect against the most dangerous abuses of this powerful technology. And we hear it from the senators themselves. They say, we know this is a space that needs new rules, but they are the first to recognize that Congress has not been able to regulate the technology we already have. Social media has been a big failure for the U.S. Congress. Congress, and they are looking to do a better job as they learn more about artificial intelligence. While you join us from, from the Hill, and Sam Altman continues to speak, and he's saying that the U.S. should form an agency to license some AI efforts. A lot of venture capitalists and founders I know do not agree with the idea of licensing. They think it's basically a block to innovation. When you have hearings like this, 
it also depends on the questions that get asked. Sometimes these lawmakers go way off topic. How much have they asked about U.S. leadership in the field of artificial intelligence outside of the regulatory debate? Yeah, there have been some thoughtful questions on this, and he's had some thoughtful answers as well. He made a really interesting point when he said, you know, the U.S. can leverage its leadership in the development of microelectronics and chips that are needed to run these powerful AI systems. The U.S. can leverage that leadership to encourage global governance so that not only are we setting rules here in the United States, but he made the point that we're not the only ones developing this technology. This is something that has a potential to impact the whole world. And for when it comes to governance of this new technology, it really needs to happen on a global level. To that end, many will be unsurprised to know that the EU has kind of been leading the regulatory charge. They're already proposing potential laws in the next month that will be eyed by the entire entirety of the European Commission. I'm interested in how much you think lawmakers are seeing what Europe is looking at, are thinking about the global ability to regulate. Well, certainly U.S. lawmakers are casting an eye at their counterparts over in Europe. And Christina Montgomery of IBM had an inter interesting little comment in her opening statement. She said, there's been a lot of hype around generative AI, but that doesn't mean we should move away from the risk-based approach that they started taking in Europe. And that was kind of a reference to what we see happening around Europe's AI Act, where they had this really well-thought-out regulation based on the risk of the use of AI rather than the actual development of this technology. And now you have ChatGP exploding onto the scene and regulators thinking, well, maybe we need to include this, gener this kind of general use tool in this regulation as well. And she's trying to argue that's what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't look at the hype around ChatGPT, these other generative AI products, and kind of um, project that onto the rest of the artificial intelligence ecosystem, which includes the kind of enterprise AI that is offered by companies like IBM. Yeah, it really is about application for many at the moment. Anna Edgerton, we thank you so much to get her back onto that hearing at the moment. And fantastic analysis coming from Capitol Hill. What about those that used to advise governments? What about those that are thinking about the application thus far of regulation? Lindsay Gorman's one of them, Senior Fellow for Emerging Technologies at the German Marshall Fund's Alliance for Securing Democracy. And Lindsay, thus far, are the right guardrails being thought about here from a global perspective? So I do think that the right issues and problems are being thought about. But I will caveat that by saying that the problems that we can anticipate today might not be the problems that end up causing us the most consternation once these technologies become more widespread. But I do think the level of literacy when it comes to what the real concerns are and also what the possibilities are being thought about, concerns around elections and disinformation and disruption of the democratic process, concerns about workforce and job displacement, and concerns about how we interact with systems and what morals and values get put into these systems on the forefront. So I do think the right questions are being asked. Of course, we can only know what we know now. And 10 years from now, we might say that we were completely looking at the problems from a different era. Lindsay, when we look at what the EU, for example, is thinking of putting in place, they want to produce risk assessments, they want to see a summarised of copyrighted material that models have been trained on. They also want it to be flagged when you're looking at AI in general, but most notably if you're looking at deep fakes. Does that, to your point of view, go far enough? And, and ultimately, are we just in a game of whack-a-mole all over again? I certainly hope not. I think the EU has obviously taken one of the most aggressive approaches to thoughtful regulation of AI with the EU AI Act and the risk-based approach. Now, in the US, NIST has also put out a risk-based framework on AI. That's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, but it's completely voluntary. One thing that I think the EU has kind of in its pocket as perhaps an advantage in coming up with thoughtful regulation is that it already has existing frameworks around data privacy. Today at the hearing, you heard multiple senators talk about the need for protecting data that's training these AI models. Because ultimately, if you're training the data on certain models, that that those biases and the biases in the data are going to be propagated and the values in the data are going to be propagated through for the models. 
Now, the EU has the general data privacy framework. The U.S. doesn't have that, and it's a little bit concerning that despite the enthusiasm with which lawmakers are tackling the AI issue, which is a positive, that we're still not able to pass federal data privacy legislation. So I do think the EU has a leg up in applying their existing frameworks, and that's why we've seen countries such as Italy apply the general data protection regulation to chat GPT and have that mm. basis for what are the things that need to be demanded, the, the common uses, the justifiability of yeah. that, which Sam Altman alluded to today. Ed, it is notable, isn't it? Every conversation we have tends to involve regulation. Everyone seems to agree it's needed yes. and not just self-regulation. But the applications of so doing is still sort of a black box here. Yeah, the, the difference our guests uh, not, notify us off on this show, Lindsay, is that if you regulate the deep learning part, the training of the models, you might kill innovation. There is a difference between regulating inference, or in other words, the use of artificial technology, the tool, and the development of it. Where do you think we should focus our regulatory efforts? Yeah, this is really the debate that you, th you heard in the hearing, which is, do we take an approach of only regulating at the point where technology meets society, i.e. the applications, or do we need to regulate in the model development? And I think both have some merits. Clearly, we need to regulate in, in the former case the, the, and focus on the actual harms that are being caused in society or that could be caused. But that said, those harms are not technology neutral. They are not applicable regardless of how you train the model. So I think that's where it gets a little bit complicated, yes. where actually the inputs to the training do make a difference on how the harms could get propagated once technology meets society. And this idea, though, that lawmakers have, have said today that we had with Section 230, where we said companies just go develop and we'll give you the space and not regulate, I don't think that's going to fly now in the AI era. Do you agree with Sam Altman that the U.S. should establish an agency to license AI development? I would like to hear more arguments on both sides, to be honest. I think we've just gotten to the, the scratching the surface on whether we need a whole new agency. But the point that I really do agree with that Sam and others made is that we definitely need much more resources, whether with that, that's with existing agencies or, in fact, a new agency. The, the idea that we could keep up with these developments and that regulators and policymakers could keep up with these developments without throwing significantly more resources into just hiring technical experts to understand and to craft policy solutions on them, I think is completely, uh, completely crazy. So whether that's a new agency or significantly beefing up of existing agencies, we, we definitely need a, a significant resource investment. We should uh, point out as well that it's not just Sam Altman. We've been talking a lot about him, but IBM's chief privacy and trust officer, Christina Montgomery, is also testifying in that, Caroline and Lindsay. Lindsay mm -hmm. Gorman, senior fellow for emerging technologies at the German Marshall Fund. Thank you. Now, coming up, Grinder reports first quarter results. We'll unpack the numbers with CEO George Arison. That's next. Meanwhile, taking a look at Singapore-based C, shares falling after earnings. Remember, Caroline, this is the tech company we reported last week that was actually raising wages after all the cuts they've done in recent months, getting more healthy, but something in that outlook and something in the earnings investors not like. The stock down significantly. This is Bloomberg. Grinder reporting first quarter earnings with revenue of $55.8 million up from $43.5 million a year earlier, around 28% gain year on year. Still shares down after reporting a net loss of $32.9 million. Let's bring in Grinder CEO George Arison for more. So kind of growth on the top line and, and I think actually uh, a decline year on year on the bottom line or an EPS. But what is the difference in the environment at the beginning of this year versus last year for people interacting with one another? 
Yeah, so look, I've only been on job for six months, so I can't really speak about the beginning of last year per se, but this year was... Really... And no one looks at backward looking yeah. data anymore, do they? Uh, uh, and this year was really good. You know, we grew really well. Our EBITDA was really strong as well at, at 39%. Both growth and EBITDA numbers exceeded uh, our full year guidance. Um, the, I think on the EPS side, there's just some stuff with warrants that makes that number look very different because of how you do warrant yes. accounting, but that doesn't really impact how our business is doing, which is extremely well. Um, users are obviously very engaged and our overall average quarterly user is also up quarter over quarter. So well, what's driving the engagement? What is it that people are, are turning to Grindr for? What well, is the behavior you see? Grindr has um, always had a lot of success in getting each new generation of people to come on the platform. So unlike a lot of other social media platforms that lose users in the new generation, we've actually not had that. We've kept users coming in. And I think, it, the, frankly, the fact that all the users are there is another reason why people come back, right? Like that, that engagement is really strong. And also Grindr is very authentic. Grindr was a company built by gay people for gay people, so it's very authentic to the user base. And I think that helps us uh, as well. Obviously, we know users want more innovation in the product, and that's something that we're very actively working on. Let's talk about the innovation. And in some ways, it feels a bit old school, George. You're, you've got Grindr Web. Talk to me about why you listened and heard from your user base that that's what they wanted. Totally. So, yeah, we just launched Grindr Web, kind of launched it this month in, in anticipation of Pride next month. Uh, and the thinking is that there are a bunch of features you can launch on the web that you can't really launch uh, anywhere else uh, because of limitations that the app stores put on you. And, and that's something that our users very much want. So Grindr Web that we've launched now, which is still in beta, and we hope users try that out, uh, is a way to set us up, up for the future to launch additional features um, that are more specific to the use cases that our users want that we can't really do on the, on the app. Monetization. What are the ways in which you're thinking about people using it, paying for it in a different, more seamless way on the app itself and indeed on web? Totally. So what we've heard from users on kind of our subscription basis is they want two things. Number one, they want a slightly higher, um, so a slightly lower cost uh, model where we are, have an entry point that's not 99.9, but something lower than that with less features, obviously, because we do offer a very broad base of features in our 99.9 tier. So we're working on that lower price tier. And then they also want us to build more features on the, on the higher end and are willing to pay for those. And obviously, a lot of the add-ons that other dating apps offer that Gwenda doesn't yet have, a la carte, we are building. And then we think there's a lot of opportunity to build functionality that supports activity that's already happening in the app, such as dating, that we don't have functionality for. As far as building on Grindr Web, we do have a big portion of users that are discrete, meaning they can't really be out for a variety of reasons, whether it's where they live or um, family situations, et cetera. And for them, Grindr Web is a really great, distinct uh, building option. That's not available yet, but it's coming because we do want to facilitate that based on what users have asked us for. This past week, one Elon Musk said that Twitter or X, the everything app, adding some dating functionality was an interesting idea. How seriously do you take that threat? I mean, let's see what he does. I, I think it'll be interesting how he approaches things. Um, and look, you never bet against Elon Musk, right? Uh, nobody else has done what he's done in terms of how many companies he's built. But we feel really good about our user base and, and the fact that our users are very engaged with us. Uh, I think our engagement numbers are, are frankly, um, you know, very unusual. Nearly an hour spent in the app. Last year, 111 billion messages sent. So um, I'm not really worried about that from our user base perspective, but more broadly, certainly inter interesting. Grinder CEO, George Arison here in San Francisco. Thank you for your time. Caro. Yeah, let's just stick on the earnings theme for a moment and look at the Chinese giant Baidu. Shares traded here in the US actually have been performing relatively well. You see up 3.5% there or thereabouts. It looks as though the company really managed to beat expectations. Stronger than expected revenue, 10%. It grew after its advertising and cloud businesses that seem to be benefiting from China's post-pandemic reopening overall. So some strength there, Ed. Meanwhile, coming up, look, we've got to talk about some worries post-Silicon Valley bank collapse. The former CEO, Greg Becker, currently testifying before the U.S. Senate committee. They're busy up on the hill today. He has to say, of course, about the focus, the failure, and what is next for regional banks more generally. We'll dig into that in a minute. This is Bloomberg. We 
of course, are dissecting everything that has been happening across in Washington. Not only the AI focus of Sam Altman, but Silicon Valley bank focus, Greg Becker. He's been testifying in front of the Senate Banking Committee today, blaming social media, in fact, for the bank's collapse. Let's dive deeper into it all with our one and only Shanali Basak. And Shanali, he's going to have a tough crowd. What ultimately do you think he's saying? Is it landing the way he hopes it to, do you think? Hey, what is interesting among the lawmakers here is you're hearing kind of two sides of the story. One is a set of lawmakers that are extraordinarily frustrated by the way SVB was managed and how much Greg Becker was paid. He declined to say whether he would give back some of his bonuses as a result of the bank's failure and the ultimate, you know, blamed mismanagement. Uh, there's a sense here also among a separate set of lawmakers that believe that a lot of this was brought on by the Fed's mismanagement as mm. well as uh, the fast rise in interest rates. You heard some lawmakers really attack the Biden administration here and uh, the inflationary environment that had led to these interest Shock rates. Shock horror. It's becoming bipartisan? It is becoming mm. certainly <laughs> very, very, very political what? on top Anti-partisan. of. And we know also for, for its own worth here, we know that Fed officials are also being uh, grilled in Washington this week and they have also outlined some series of their own failure of oversight for some of these firms right. as well and the FDIC. Of course, Shanali, we have been listening into that hearing. Let's take a listen to just some of what Greg Becker had to say. I believe that SVB's failure was brought about by a series of unprecedented events. Despite stark differences in our business models, news reports and investors wrongly lumped SVB and Silvergate together. Rumors and misconceptions quickly spread online, culminating on March 9th with the first ever social media bank run leading to $42 billion in deposits being withdrawn from SVB in 10 hours, or roughly $1 million every second. Uh, he claims different factors, SVB, Silvergate. But did we hear any sort of admission, Shanali, quickly on him taking responsibility for what happened? I don't think he took responsibility for all of it, and I think that's the important part here. Uh, remember this idea of a social media-fueled bank run. There's a lot still to be understood about how that happened, because remember, every bank CEO across the country and every private equity firm trying to back them yes. is now having that same question. Can this happen again? That's why these hearings are still so important, because what kind of changes need to be made to the banking system coming out of this beyond the politics that we're obviously seeing play out today? All right, Bloomberg, Shanali, Basic on the Wall Street beat, but a story that really hit here, the heart of Silicon Valley. Coming up, startup Hippocratic AI raising 50 million to power bots in the healthcare system. Our exclusive interview with CEO Monjal Shah next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. All about AI, but let's get a check in on the markets. I think there's still a lot of lingering concern, Cara, about the debt ceiling and the progress that we're seeing or lack of in Washington, D.C. NASDAQ 100 outperformance in tech up half a percentage point. We've been talking about Baidu having strong earnings. That is an outperformer in terms of the U.S. listed shares of China tech. Alibaba reports later in the week, but there are some movers like Tencent to the downside. The NASDAQ Golden Dragon China Index, that basket of U.S. listed China shares down half a percentage point. Yields climbing higher, six basis points, 3.6% ish on the U.S. 10 year yield where we were kind of in March. Bitcoin back down towards 27,000 U.S. dollars per token. In terms of the individual movers, I talked a little bit about Baidu, that moving to the upside, strong earnings beat, top and bottom line. The story about a rebound in China after the Chinese New Year, easing of restrictions, travel starting back up, also the ad business doing well, and AI. AI everything, all the hmm. time AI. There's no sort of main catalyst, but you know, Alphabet parent of Google has seen gains since Google I.O. when we learn more about its offering. Amazon, Bloomberg reporting, making moves. Bring us some of those details because that is what the real move is to the upside is. Oh, 
Perfect segue, Ed, into talking tech. First up, Alphabet, you were just talking about making back market cap ground as its artificial intelligence game seems to be back on. Remember, it seemed to be lagging behind its peers, wasn't it, in the race to deploy generative AI products. Abundance of caution, many would call it. But Google's parent company has added more than $115 billion in market value since unveiling plans for its AI tools last week at the event you were at. Meanwhile, if you've been scouring the job boards for AI-related jobs, Amazon might have some listed. The e-commerce giant is planning to add ChatGPT-style search function to its online store. It's according to job posts reviewed by Bloomberg News. Of course, as a part of a larger effort to rival efforts by Microsoft, by Google, to weave these generative AI elements into its own search engine set. All right, healthcare startup Hippocratic AI staking its claim in the large language model boom with its tool, which it hopes to make medical care more accessible. The Palo Alto-based company launched out of stealth today, raising $50 million in a seed round from Andreessen Horowitz and General Catalyst. Here in the studio with me, Sunjao Shah, Munjao Shah, sorry, CEO of Hippocratic AI. $50 million for a seed round. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Uh, Tell yeah. me, let, let me just ask, what is the valuation on this? You've come out with a, a, a large language model you say is commercially ready. Right. What's your valuation? Uh, you know, we're not announcing that today, but um, we really felt that generative AI has really captured the imagination of really the world, right? And it's captured the zeitgeist. And when you think about its application to healthcare, you realize, you know, there's three million missing healthcare workers in this country. We do not have enough people after the pandemic. So many burned out. And there's really no way to close that gap except using technologies like generative AI to do that. But the misconception out there this morning is that you have released a chat GPT style bot <laughs> that replaces the doctor. Exactly. The physician. That's not the case at all, though. No, no. You know, we actually don't think that generative AI is ready to do diagnoses. We think diagnoses needs to come much later when these models are safe. We think that there's a set of applications. Though, you know, healthcare is way bigger than just the doctor. There are so many people who you talk about back office. Not just back office. You have uh, registered dietitians. You have uh, genetic counselors. You have you know many other roles that are supporting roles and supporting actors in the healthcare uh, system that really could benefit from generative AI. I'm interested in what you see as the regulatory environment with which you put this. People are going to be fearful of medical advice plus chat GPT, many already knowing that you shouldn't, you're shouldn't. you not going to get an abundance of, of advice when you go into OpenAI's product, when you go into BARD. And interestingly, we're hearing from Sam Altman at the moment thinking about regulatory pressure, saying that it's for OpenAI, for Google to take on board, but they don't want to slow down smaller startups. As a man who's been in AI for throughout your learning experience when you're at university, when you went on to further your education, when you've gone on to build companies, is regulation going to help or hinder you? Uh, you know, I think that this is an area that does need um, a regulatory framework um, and one that allows us all to create safe large language models and safe generative AI. Um, you know, we decided when, as we were building um, uh, Hippocratic AI that we wanted to be safety first. Like, this was the foundation of how we design the company and how we design the product. I mean, you know, our name is Hippocratic, like the Hippocratic Oath. Mm. Our tagline is do no harm. This is our number one focus as a company. And we focused on a set of key features to be able to do that, which I'm, I'm happy to share with yeah, you. Yeah, let's guys. delve in because I, we understand your startup has the AI has passed more than 100 healthcare certifications and outperformed OpenAI. What is the data that you're training on and what are the safety principles you've wound into that? Yeah, so we built in four or five things to really make this safer. I mean, I think the first was we certified it. We didn't just say, hey, let's pass the US MLE, the medical licensing exam, where some of the language models have posted their results on. We said, let's also look at the NACLEX, the nursing exam, the um, pharmacy exam, the uh, NAPLEX, and we just said, hey, let's go through all of these. And we did 114 of these different exams, grouped them into groups like all the dental exams together, all the physician exams, and said, hey, it's important to be certified. These are actually the exact exams you see at the end of your uh, nurse's name on her badge. She has all those little letters. We all made sure badge. we had all of those, those. Those same certifications used to hire healthcare workers are the same certifications we used and tested on our language model. Uh, second, we actually uh, recruited 
those exact same healthcare workers, so pediatric nurses came in and gave our system feedback on how it was doing on those questions. Our dietitians came in and did the same. And so we believe who's best to judge the accuracy of a healthcare, of a language model than the people doing those exact jobs today. And so, um, you know, those are two of about four or five different things that we've done to um, really make this a, uh, a safer system. Let's do a quick fire round. When do you make the LLM open to the public? Mm. You know, we have decided on a um, threshold-based launch strategy than a time-based launch when? strategy. We're saying when those professionals that I just told you about, when we have the dietitians using it and they say this is ready to go out, that's when it'll go out. How do you monetize? Uh, we will figure that out after we make sure that we build a safe and ready uh, language model. I think, again, you can't say your safety first and be like, I'm launching on this date. You have to say, I'm launching when the language model uh, is ready and the professionals who do that task today say it's ready. Manjal, you s said, and I'm, and I'm sure you didn't, it was a sort of a comment that just comes out, but you said, nurses, she. And... I'm, in many ways, I mean, we say, yeah, a lot of nurses are female. But therein lies some of the issue and the concern around bias within these sorts of AI models and the data that's run. I'm sure you're thinking deeply about how, particularly from a medical perspective, biases aren't built in. How do you counteract for that going forward? Uh, you know, we've already begun testing the bias of the model. You can actually go on our site at hippocraticai.com slash benchmarks. And um, you can take a look at our first pass of assessing the bias of our model on a bunch of different dimensions, including certain ethnic biases and certain gender biases. And, um, you know, so far, um, you know, we were able to show less bias than GPT-4. Um, but that's just the beginning. That's our first installment, our down payment on really just trying to say, hey, look, we just launched, but we're already testing this. We already care about this, and it's something that we're going to continue to work on each and every day. I just point out to our audience, I wrote about this this morning, uh, Hippocratic AI. They benchmarked or tested against ChatGPT in 114 certifications. I went to OpenAI and asked for them to comment on that performance relative to Hippocratic AI. OpenAI did not reply. Just putting that out there to our global audience. Caroline, thanks to Munjal Shah, of course, CEO of Hippocratic AI on the day they raised $50 million in a seed from two big names. Now, turning to m and Twitter parent company X Corp has acquired a tech talent recruiting service called Lasky. That, according to a Bloomberg source. Full disclosure, Bloomberg Beta, part of Bloomberg LP, was an investor in Lasky. Bloomberg's Asia Counts has us, uh, joins us with more. Asia Lasky, what is it and why? Lasky is a early, it was an early stage startup that does recruiting. So it matches employers with candidates. Very straightforward. It's not exactly clear why X Corp or Twitter was interested in buying this company, but Musk has talked about this idea of creating an everything app. So it could be a part of that broader vision. So we're all left kind of trying to fill in the dots. Meanwhile, Lasky doesn't seem to be operating anymore online. And I'm waiting for the latest tweet out of their pretty... Uh, active tweeter in chief, their CEO does a lot online. What remind us of the overall vision of the X product? Because many would say that's why the new CEO of Twitter, for example, has come on board. Right, that's one thing that Musk has said when he announced the the hiring of Linda Yaccarina officially on his Twitter account. He said this is going to be part of the vision to create this everything app or this X app. And so Musk has been pretty vocal about this. He sees it as an app where you can do everything from maybe making payments, like booking a ticket or sending money to a friend. He hasn't exactly explained what it is, but he's taking ideas from things like Uber, where you can like order food and also order a cab or even WeChat in China. So he's talked about uh, Twitter being a place where, where you can do that, where you can do anything that you might be able to imagine and adding in the payments infrastructure as well. Aisha, it's great to catch up with you. Thank you, Aisha Counts. Meanwhile, we've got our VC Spotlight next, Ed, and it's with someone who, well, knows Elon Musk and has backed him in some of those other companies. From New York, from San Francisco, it's a Bloomberg.
last 10 years of financial services has seen an extraordinary change. Uh, the advent of digital banking, mobile banking, uh, and all of the technology-enabled services that we've now come to consider to be table stakes. The next 10 years is going to take that technology impact and expand it exponentially. There are enablers to that, but the primary driver is going to be related to the deployment of artificial intelligence. Former JP Morgan executive Blythe Masters there speaking about the big innovations that will reshape, reshape fintech space in particular, but actually every industry when it comes to AI. Let's bring in Andrea Lamari from Manhattan Ventures Partners for more on the world of investing, the world of, well, in, in fact, your own portfolio is fascinating. Discord, of course, many ways AI driven, but Klarna, one of those companies, a fintech business that's already used a ChatGPT plugin, an open AI plugin. How are you thinking about the ethical way in which these companies do adopt and let this generative AI run loose on their own proprietary data? Thanks, Carolyn. So overall, we are really thinking about generative AI as a tool for good. But what it's showing to be is that companies are learning so much more about their consumer base and allowing their consumers to spend time showing trends in a much more vulnerable way, which we find fascinating. The way that Klarna is engaging with their customers on a new level and a way that they're gathering the data to prove that there are ways to use and harness the data to really provide better products and services to consumers from a lending perspective and then from a spend perspective. And it seems as though consumers are really engaging with the AI in a way that just seems so much more real and authentic than they ever have. If financial conditions are getting tighter and it's hard out there for founders, are venture capitalists being pushed into making AI-related investments that in any other economy or environment they just wouldn't normally make because of all of the hype? Overall, what's so interesting about the VCs in the space making AI bets is that so many companies were already utilizing AI functionality as a way to harness data and then use insights of that artificial intelligence data to build better products. But what's funny is that VCs today are having a hard time determining what's actually going to make money at. So some of these companies are really taking a push towards open sourcing the technology versus actually making it a repeatable subscription-based business. And I think that's the big debate within VC world is what's going to actually make money. I'm going to jump on that. What's actually going to make money? <laughs> you invest in SpaceX. When is SpaceX going to make money? Is SpaceX ever going to IPO or, or spin off Starlink? Well, overall, SpaceX does have a lot of cash, and they do make money by way of the Starlink spaceships and uh, satellite services, because overall, what's fascinating is a lot of people across the world, now that it's in every continent, are spending money on Starlink, and it's generating a ton of revenue. But what we do think is that Starlink is big enough as a business that they could spin it off eventually, right? And I do see an independent IPO. Um, if we just see that uh, Musk were to in integrate uh, generative AI into SpaceX, it might just be a done deal, though, uh, if that were the case. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about tomorrow's IPOs today, which is what Manhattan Ventures Partners sort of tagline is. You're all about the secondary market in many ways. And just what is the secondary market like for an Elon-backed company? I mean, whether it be the vision of X, whether it's SpaceX, or whether it's any of the companies you have in your portfolio right now, are people willing and able and wanting to buy in the secondary market? So right now, it is absolutely fascinating because you're getting to see that the secondary market is driving the true value of every single private company. And overall, I think it's the real indicator for where investors are willing to buy and shareholders are looking to sell. So I think we've never seen a more op clear opportunity to dive into the secondary market. And what's fascinating is companies themselves are coming to us and coming to many others in the secondary market space and saying, we don't really know what the value of our company is in the current market because we last raised a big round of funding in mid-2021. And so the top indicator, the leading indicator we're seeing is the secondary market to price companies at their true asset value. So it's fascinating to see it. And we ourselves are seeing the opportunities are growing exponentially in a way that uh, the companies are, are thankful that there's a real indicator that goes beyond uh, a new round of primary financing. Hmm. I mean, isn't it, Ed, at the moment, when we're ever talking about a primary round of financing, it tends to be AI related in some way, shape or form? It does. Yeah, I think that's the part that we, we all want to understand better, Andrea, which is just forget a news cycle or a hype cycle. 
what are you doing to wake up each day and say, OK, here's where we're going to deploy capital. Here's our plan for 2023. Here's, our, you know, I, what I'm trying to understand is what is driving investment thesis for VCs right now. What's interesting about the thesis driven approach with all VCs is that all the companies that are approaching us and we are approaching them for capital raising is that they're really looking to preserve the valuation that they last had. And it, it is almost a uh, valuation at all uh, at all stake at all you know, permutations of evaluation. So what's interesting is that from a thesis perspective, we're determining whether or not to invest in companies that have investor sweeteners involved in the na- next round of funding, or maybe it is that the best entry price is that secondary market value. Um, maybe that next round of funding is, you know, cluttered with really strong investor provisions that allow for protection mm-hmm. and upside. Um, and so I think a lot of investors in our space, especially in the growth and late stage, are determining whether or not that next round of funding is, a, is attractive enough to go into relative to secondary. Andrea, after Linda Yaccarino news came on Twitter, did that bump the valuation that you've been seeing for Twitter? I know it's part of your portfolio post it going private. Is that something that you think is getting a clearer destination and getting investors more interested? Having Linda involved, we think, is a very strong indicator of where we believe uh, Elon is playing the C-level shuffle, what we like to call, right? So bringing in the strong adults in the room to really bring in uh, a background in advertising and media, which overall that is what Twitter really is focused on, right? Advertising, media, and content-driven. So I think it's a strong signal. Linda is a phenomenal executive with an incredible background that I think many of us in the industry are very impressed with their ability to land. Uh, So I think generally we consider that a massive positive. Manhattan Ventures partner Andrea Lamari, who's able, Caroline, to talk about every news item that's hit this week (laughs) and has investments related to every subsector that we discuss. So thank you so much for your time. In other news, East Ventures, Southeast Asia's most active early stage tech investment firm, raised $250 million for its 12th fund, a rare sign of confidence in the global tech sector during a tumultuous year. The Indonesia-focused firm says it will allocate the money as follow-on investments toward growth portfolio companies that demonstrate strong potential. Now, coming up, one billionaire unloaded more than half a billion dollars worth of Alphabet shares in an apparent gift. Any guesses? This is Bloomberg. Going viral, Ed, is the unusual gift from Google co-founder Sergey Brin. In a filing that we saw Monday, it shows that he gifted Alphabet shares worth $600 million last Thursday. It's actually kind of unclear who's got the 5.2 million shares. We, of course, know that it could be perhaps to charity or to a trust or another financial instrument. But ultimately, this is on a week where Brin and his co-founder Larry Page saw their wealth surge at a combined $18 billion. And we know why. It's all because of AI. Yeah, look, it all comes out of momentum from Google I.O., where we finally understood how Alphabet takes its competence and puts it into its tools. But I was there, right? And I would say they stressed deliberate, slow rollout, Mm. safety, guardrails. And now we have Altman speaking on Capitol Hill. Yeah, who's again been stressing safety. We know that the, it's wrapped up now, the Senate hearing that features Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, yes. as well as IBM, as well as scientists. But ultimately, he's really saying that there are no plans for chat GPT-5 training in the next six months. That seems to be sort of under some duress. We'd heard that from some of his colleagues on Twitter saying, look, whatever you might be hearing, GPT-5 isn't currently underway. But notably, everyone wants to know what this has on the startup culture, what this has in terms of society, too. And again, he, Altman says the pressure should be on the leaders, OpenAI and Google, the name check. Mm. That was Richard Blumenthal, the Ken- Connecticut Democrat who chairs that subcommittee, committee. And he also had questions about the U.S. leadership yeah. in this field. Yeah, vis-a-vis China, something that we continue to discuss. How can you regulate without offsetting innovation? And what a thoroughly deep dive of a show we had today. That does it for this edition, though, of Bloomberg Technology. Tomorrow, well, we've got Patrick Zong, founding partner of M31 from Salt, iConnections in New York. You don't want to miss it. Yeah.